Hello and welcome to this edition of Quality of Life. Today we're going to be looking at the aspects of heroin addiction and the consequences it can have on one's quality of life. Joining us today to cover this subject is Dr. Howard Croft from St. Nicholas Hospital Emergency Department. Welcome to the show, Howard. Good morning. Thank you. Um, you're currently the medical director of St. Nicholas Hospital Emergency, correct? I am. And how long have you been doing that? For about the last uh, three years. Okay. Okay, it's good to have you there. Okay, the subject of heroin, heroin addiction, how long have you been dealing with this and making the presentations that you've been doing and making the awareness? Well, we put together, uh, this is a program that's been in place now for a little over, I'd say a little over a year this started. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we put together a, uh, a series of presentations. One of the things we wanted to do was, was obviously to educate the public and so one of the first things we did was to put together a presentation and we've then been taking this presentation around to the community to various uh, uh, school groups mm -hmm. and uh, church groups, clubs and the like. Okay. With the problem of heroin, I know you, I hear the Sheboygan Police Department and their battles with trying to, you know, reduce the amount of heroin being used in trafficking. How large is this scope or how large is this issue? Well, I think, you know, probably one of the first things to do is to kind of step back and the, uh, the scope is, right now, the unfortunate thing is the scope is really large. And uh, to kind of put it in perspective, um, you know, when we start talking about heroin addiction, we also kind of tie in prescription drug abuse as okay. well. And um, to, give, to give you kind of a little idea of where we sit, um, the United States has about 5% of the world's population. And we know that presently we consume somewhere in the range of 85 to 90 percent of the world's narcotics. Oh my goodness! So, um, so we have, you know, I mean, so we are. So narcotics are very prevalent in our population in general. Um, and then the other thing is, yes, we're starting to see there's there's just a rampant increase lately in heroin. And uh, and then we can. We can get into why that is because there's several issues as to as to what has kind of caused the resurgence of heroin. Okay, what about on a local level, like here in Sheboygan, Sheboygan County, or even Wisconsin? Is the problem follow you know mirror what it is in the nation, or are we above or below average? Well, I, again, I think that that's kind of hard to measure. What I can tell you is that the problem is it's very prevalent. It is all across the nation, and there's certainly some pockets that are that are more prevalent than others. But um, I think the important thing to note is that it is here. It absolutely is in our community. And I know um, one of the other things that we did over the last year was we sent out a community-wide survey. And uh, we got, a, actually, we got a pretty tremendous response considering the population uh, for Sheboygan County. We had over 1,300 people respond to the survey. Wow. And the results of the survey were actually pretty stunning. Um, we noticed that uh, you know over over a quarter of the respondents um, either knew somebody that was affected by heroin addiction, whether it was through um, theft and crime in their area, whether they knew somebody that had sought treatment, and uh, almost 10 percent of the people that responded uh, basically said that they knew somebody that had used heroin within the last month. So. Again, we're, we're faced with a problem that is, um, you know, we can't deny it. It is, mm -hmm. it is absolutely within our community. I would definitely agree because I have friends that I know who have experimented with drugs that I didn't even know of or would even think so. Definitely, and it can be hidden pretty well, too, at first. Yeah, well, and it, 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 the other thing is it cuts across all the different patient yep. populations. It cuts across all the different yep. populations. It's not isolated. You know, when we used to think of heroin, we used to think of people in the back alleys. Mm -hmm. We used to think of people that, uh, you know, the poorer populations and the like. And the reality is um, today's heroin addiction is it cuts all across the board. It's, it's wealthy, it's poor, mm -hmm. it's rural, it's suburban. Um, we're seeing it pretty much everywhere, and so Sheboygan County is clearly one of the targeted areas. Okay. With your presentation and your experience and background with the project that you are working on, is there a case study or an example you'd like to share or bring into the mix? 
Well, um, a lot of times when I give the presentation, we, we do give, I, I do like to give um, a kind of a case study, if you will, something that kind of, some people can kind of relate a little bit to what it looks like. Um, and the case that I typically have used is a 17-year-old who um, we found um, basically unresponsive, who was found unresponsive in a bathtub and had track marks. And track marks are little scars. They're scars that are uh, along the sites of veins uh, for people that have injected um, IV drugs. Um, this 17-year-old was not able to be um, was not able to be resuscitated um, and ultimately died. Um, two two things that are kind of interesting. One is that um, it's not unusual for us to find these victims in bathtubs. Um, heroin typically kills because it, it basically stops the person from breathing. It basically suppresses your right. respirations, and uh, and it's kind of it's kind of a a, a little bit of a myth that if you um, put somebody in an ice bath that they're going to gasp or somehow start breathing again. Um, we know that that's actually not true. In this case, obviously it wasn't true. But the, re the main reason that I bring up this case is because this happened, this was my home. This wow. happened, I was 15 years old, um, and this was a friend of my brother's. And I came home and, and uh, again, it, it, what it showed me was that it can be anywhere, and um, and you know we I grew up in a in a middle class suburb, mm -hmm. and so it's not again it's not a problem of you know it cuts across all populations it's not necessarily a problem of rich or poor, and um, it has the it has the unfortunate ability to affect any of us. Wow, wow. With with the problem at hand. Why heroin? Why has it returned? Why has it become so popular over the other types of drugs? Well, and, that, and I think that that's a good question. There's a, I think that there's a bunch of things that have gone on um, over the past several years that kind of have led to where we are with heroin. Um, one of the first things that happened was um, in, the, in the late 90s, there was a big push by um, the federal government and by a lot of our regulating agencies for for uh, physicians to aggressively treat pain. In fact, um, what we did was we, there was a campaign um, put on by our, um, by our accrediting organization, um, and they listed pain as what they called the fifth vital sign. So they really pushed it on physicians that we were supposed to really aggressively treat pain. And so the, um, with that big push, one of the, so what happened was you saw a big flourishing uh, you know, prescription drug, um, you saw prescription drug use actually mm -hmm. skyrocket. Um, the other thing that's gone on is, is over the last several years, we've become obviously, we've become significantly aware of the problems of prescription drug abuse, and so we've started to clamp down on that. Um, and that's happened a couple, a couple different ways. In, 2000, in the beginning of 2013, Wisconsin put together a uh, website. It's a prescription drug monitoring program. And um, that website allows us to take a look for each individual patient that we're treating. We can look on that website and we can see all the prescriptions for controlled substances mm -hmm. that that person's filled. So that gives us a real good idea of who's potentially misusing prescription drugs. That's one aspect. And then the other thing is we've started to see the federal government has started to change certain things like formulations. Um, in two th for example, in 2010, they changed the formulation of OxyContin so that um, it could no longer be put into a liquid form because what we had was so there were a lot of people that were taking OxyContin, they were, they were um, getting it, you know, dissolving it sure. in water and injecting it. Um, the federal government recognized all the abuse of OxyContin and basically started to take steps to curb that. Um, so really what you started to have is you started to have the pendulum swinging back. We had all these people that were using prescription drugs and now we started to restrict, find ways to restrict their use and restrict the potential for abuse. And so what we did was we started to create a situation where actually heroin has now moved in. And the reason that heroin has moved in is because it now is cheaper, unfortunately, to get heroin 
in, than it is to, um, to maintain a habit for, of uh, prescription drugs. Really? Yeah. And wow. that's, that's a shocker. That's why we, and, and that's a lot of why we are mm -hmm. where we are right now. Um, and then the other thing we note is that, uh, and, and again, prescription drugs are, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of young people get into it, whether it's with their mother's or father's drugs that you know, are in the cabinet around the house or grandma's drugs or what, whatever it is. But, um, but it's not difficult to find the first few uh, pills or so. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also know that it's a gateway drug. The prescription drugs are how, that's how heroin addiction typically starts. That most people that get addicted to heroin start off with pills. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I may add, there's you know, a few times when treated in the hospital or doctor's office where, you know, what's your pain level? You know, the one to 10 scale, and if I'd say, oh, it's a two or a three, well then I would get a prescription, you know, whether it's oxycodone or whatever, or like in the hospital, well they hung a bag of, you know, a little bit of Demerol and I'm going, that stuff to me just kind of wipes me out. You get kind of all dizzy and kind of tingly and such. And you know, it, it, I think it makes me more try to forget about the pain and when it really solves the pain. You know, I can still tell the pain is there, but it just numbs you up so much that you really don't pay attention to it. At least that's how it affects me. Well, and, and again, I, I think what you're describing, and, and that's really true, mm -hmm. um, it kind of numbs you up. There's a little euphoria associated with it, and we know that that's what's so, and particularly with heroin, if you inject heroin, the unfortunate thing is you get a very rapid, intense, euphoric feeling. And, um, and that's, what makes it so, that's what makes it so terribly addicting. Mm -hmm. And we know that 75% of people that try heroin will do it again. So, um, so we've gotta stop it before it even starts. That's gonna be the key. So we've identified heroin as obviously one of the major issue. I know you've talked about it a little bit already, but if we could go more into what is it really and how is it used? I know injection is one method. What are other methods that you can use with heroin? Well, that's, uh, so there's kind of two parts to that. Yeah. The first part is what is it? Well, heroin is, heroin is um, it's a drug that is made from the resin of the poppy plant. And so there's, uh, and, and you know, if you go in like Afghanistan, that's, I think mm -hmm. that that's, that's like their number one cash crop. Um, and what they do is they, they harvest this resin, they um, get it into a nice powder form, and then they end up shipping it across the country, and it, and, or out of the country, mm -hmm. and, and it finds its way um, to us in the United States. Um, the other issue with heroin is it doesn't just come to us in its pure form. So not only, not only um, do you see heroin that's coming across, you know, again, it may be, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot stronger or more pure when it comes into the country. What ends up happening is um, it gets cut, if you will. That's mm -hmm. what they call it. So what you do is, so they add other compounds to it to basically increase the amount. Um, and one of the other problems that we have is depending on what they cut it with, some of the, some of the things that they cut it with um, can be dangerous in and of themselves. Sure. So we're seeing things like, you know, you can see things like um, there's Dorman, which is, a, which is Benadryl. You can see some benign things like that. But I know in the area, um, I know the police have actually found heroin that was cut with Ajax. Oh my God. So there's some terrible stuff that's out there. Um, there have been a rash of deaths in the East Coast from heroin that was actually cut with a more potent narcotic called fentanyl. Mm. So again, the, the, one of the problems you run into is, it's, this is not, it's not a pharmaceutical, it's not a, it's not a, you know, this is not a drug that's made in a lab. Um, there's no pharmaceutical regulation. You really don't know what you're getting. The percentage of, of the heroin that you're getting can vary all across the board. I know that most of the heroin, most of what I've seen quoted is that, is that the purity of heroin that we see here in Wisconsin is in the 15 to 20 percent range. But I know that we've seen, uh, according to State Lab, we've seen heroin that's up to 70 percent pure. Wow. And so the point is that you really, when, when people are injecting this stuff, they, they may not necessarily know what they're getting, and so they may end up getting into significant trouble because there's variation in the purity, and 
it's, it's adulterated with all sorts of different types of uh, compounds. Wow. Wow. What are a lot of the effects of the drug when well, you take it? And, and we should go back. Okay. Uh, initially, I would say, initially most people start off with smoking heroin. So heroin okay. can be smoked, it can be, um, it can be ingested, or it can be um, injected. Um, the unfortunate thing is most people choose, you know, initially they start off, they may start off with smoking, um, but eventually they move to the injection. And the reason is because of the intense euphoric rush that sure. people get from it. Um, as far as the effects of heroin, um, again, we said there's this intense initial euphoria, and then afterwards, um, you start to see people, they start to go, they start to kind of like go um, in and out of kind of like a sleepy phase. They call that being um, on the nod. So there's periods where they're more wakeful and there's periods when they're more sleepy. Um, if you actually go on the internet, you can, look up, you can look this stuff up. If you put it on the nod, you actually, there's all sorts of videotapes of, of people falling over and falling into objects that are on the nod. Um, and as you, you know, might realize, I mean, I, you know, to have somebody potentially driving a car, mm -hmm. um, you know, after having used heroin, um, you know, the potential for danger for the rest of the community is just huge. Absolutely. Um, as far as the medical effects, <clears throat> um, a good way to think of it, you know, the way I always think of narcotics, a good way to think of it is, it, is that it slows down everything. So narcotics and heroin, what they do is they'll slow down, they, they lower your blood pressure, they slow your pulse, and they depress your respirations. And they also actually depress your temperature too. Okay. Um, and the way people get into trouble, as we said before, the way people get into trouble is that they end up, unfortunately, they, they, we suppress the respirations to the point that they basically stop breathing. And there's no way to really resuscitate them because it's that far past. Well, and, and again, it depends on yep. when you get to them. Yep. Um, there, yeah, there is, you know, and, and we, are, we are starting to work on legislation, actually, mm -hmm. on statewide and actually national to get, there, there's, a, there's a narcotic antagonist called Narcan. Okay. And we're starting to get that out, to, out into the community in the hands of, uh, in the hands of our ambulance uh, personnel so that if they find somebody and they think it's a, think it's a heroin overdose, they'll be able to administer that because that actually, that pretty rapidly will turn around the effects mm -hmm. of, the, of the heroin. Okay. So in your case study or someone who starts down the heroin path and you keep on going, what are the consequences eventually they're gonna face? Keeping well, down that path. Again, there's, there's kind of there's the short-term consequences that we kind of talked about. Mm -hmm. The whole you know, decrease in respiratory rate and yep. stopping breathing. Um, and then there's the long-term consequences. Because again, you're injecting something into your vein that, um, that is uncontrolled. There's no regulatory industry or anything. There's nothing to controlling that. And so you end up, you can end up with effects locally, so you can do damage to the vein and the local mm -hmm. tissue, you can end up with skin abscesses. Um, and the other thing is what you inject into your veins goes directly to your lungs and heart. And so we see people that end up with um, heart valve infections and significant lung infections from, from injecting you know, foreign materials and infective materials into their veins. Um, and then the other thing we see is, you know, people, I mean, this, it's not the cleanest, um, you know, unfortunately this is, you know, people may share needles and mm -hmm. it's not the cleanest, um, you know, they don't always use the cleanest uh, injecting techniques. And so they can end up with, um, you know, HIV and hepatitis also is spread sure. by um, IV drug abuse. So both hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Um, so there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of systemic and long-term effects. And then obviously the thing that, unfortunately, the thing that we're you know, seeing the most now is we're seeing you know, deaths in the community from the short-term effects. Wow. Wow. How can, I, how can I tell if somebody's actually using or abusing heroin? Well, and I think, again, that, that, this is a great question. This is, when, when we're giving these talks to the community, what we want to do is we want people to be able to look at their family or their friends or acquaintances we want to kind of educate them on what are the signs that they need to look for, what things, and, and again, 
I, I think that they're pretty common things. You know, we see people who start to withdraw socially. We see changes in, you know, for kids, we can see changes in schoolwork. Um, we can see people who are, uh, you know, um, starting to be secretively, that kind of stuff. We also see people that, again, you know, they talk about wearing long sleeve shirts in hot mm -hmm. weather. Not unusual, but I would say um, one of the biggest things that we see is we see, we see theft. We start to see, you know, I mean, if you have a family member and all of a sudden stuff is disappearing around mm -hmm. the house, um, whether, whatever kind of valuables, money, jewelry, whatever it is, TVs, um, that's a big red flag. And you see that kind of stuff, you see, change, again, the changes mm -hmm. in behavior, um, those are things to really tune into. And, and really, for, you know, for most people, I think that, I, I can tell you that when I talk to families who, or loved ones where someone has died from, uh, from heroin, we see that in the emergency department, um, to a T, every single one of them, every single one of them will say, you know, I, I, I saw things and there, there were things, I knew something was wrong and I, and I just didn't say anything about it. I just didn't do anything. Okay. So the other side of it is, is we've been through the scope of how it can affect people, how they take it, you know, the consequences. What can we do to really turn this around? Well, and I think that the first thing that we can do is what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it. You know, we can take it to our schools. We can take it to our church groups. We can, we need to let people know that number one, it's out there. It's in our community. We can't, you know, you know hiding our head in the sand, sand. Is, is absolutely the wrong thing to do. We need to be willing to talk about this stuff. We need to be open and honest about it. And once we identify it, we need to be able to give people, we need to empower people, we need to give them resources. You know, you know where do mm -hmm. I go? Who do I call? Um, you know, it, we, need to, we need to not be looking the other way. If we're gonna make a dent in this and, and, and we're gonna prevent our, our children from being affected and our neighbors and friends mm -hmm. from being affected, we gotta be upfront with this and we gotta be willing to, to talk with people and confront when we, when we see the signs and symptoms. With what you just described, I think it's a great, great approach. Taken into effect, you know, if we had this type of a program back when your brother's friend had his mishap, do you think there could have been any chance that it would have been noticed or education and would have been a chance to save him? Oh, I think that, I think that there's no question. I think mm -hmm. that that's, that's absolutely the case. Again, you know, now you, this was a long time ago, right, obviously. Right. Um, but we have, we have, you know, we do have a fair number of community resources that are available. And we do have the ability to intervene. And I'm not gonna tell you that there's not, that there's not a high, you know, rate of recidivism. There's not, a, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to treat. Correct. But we absolutely know that if we do nothing, there is clearly a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. And there's a, and, and, and there are people that are affected and, um, and there are people that, you know, that peop we've had, we have several, we've had several mm -hmm. deaths last year um, in our emergency department. Um, and that doesn't even speak of the, the people that were found dead in the community that didn't right. even make it to the emergency department. Right. So, so yeah, this is, I mean, this is a big deal. And, and we have to, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to do is <clears throat> we need to be able to have available to people the resources to treat this. We can identify it and, and we do, you know, we have, we do have some community resources and I think one of, one of the things that we're trying to do with this program is to increase the number of resources that we have available for treatment. Mm -hmm. I know one, another statistic or issue that I've noticed, you know, just mine and here at the TV station as well is a lot of people fail their drug tests when applying for work. And I mean, that's another consequence, I think, which then can contribute to the downward spiral as well when they want to try and get a job and they fail. I mean, that's a huge issue too going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I, and again, you know, I think, I think the key with this thing is, again, we need information. Mm -hmm. We need information to be out there. There's no question, it has, yes, it, it has long-term effects on people. It can certainly affect their ability to be employed in our community. 
But, um, but again, I mean, a lot of these things, these are, a lot of these are life and death, you know, particularly with yep. heroin. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this, is, this is a whole, to me, this is like a whole, it's a whole different animal. I mean, right. this is something that we can't, you know, we can't ignore this. We've, we've got to address this. Um, we've got to educate people. Um, and then we talk about, you know, so where can people go and what can yeah. they do? Um, and I'll tell you that the, the, what we've done is through this program we put together, there's, there's really kind of three resources that people can go to. One is, um, it's called the SAMHSA website. And the SAMHSA website, it's S-A-M-H-S-A. Um, the SAMHSA website, basically it's, it's more of an informational website. It's a national website that gives people information on, on addiction mm -hmm. and what treatment and what treatment and like might look like. Locally, there's two really good resources. One, the one that I recommend the most is Mental Health America, and there's a there's a there's a phone number for Mental Health America that uh, we should definitely put up. Yep. Um, and the key with Mental Health America that I the thing that I really like it's kind of a one stop shop. So basically, they have the ability they have um, they can talk to you about what kind of you know insurance or whatever whatever kind of whatever your situation is, and they can guide you to the resources that are available in our community. Um, the thing with Mental Health America is they're not they're not twenty they're not available twenty four seven, and so um, on the off hours, we also have a Sheboygan County Mental Health Crisis Line, and that is man twenty four seven, and and that crisis line can also steer you to the right resource, mm -hmm. um, and I would again I would encourage people when you find out about this stuff. The, the most important thing is not to look the other way. Um, and then the other thing is, and we've been, you know, we've been trying to promote, you know, we, we want the community to understand um, that this stuff is out there and this stuff affects people. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so there are billboards. We put up a couple billboards. Um, the state of Wisconsin um, has, um, has put in uh, a website called theflyeffect.com. And if you go to theflyeffect.com, the neat thing about that is um, you'll actually see a bunch of case studies. Uh, people have been generous enough to spend time basically talking about the stories of uh, their loved ones and how it's affected their family and what's happened to them. Um, and I, again, I, I think you know, it's a, it's a wake-up call for all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, it's time for us to wrap. So, Dr. Croft, I'd love, love to have you on the show and talking about heroin. I think this was a great episode. Um, just to add on to what, you know, community awareness, I know the Sheboygan Police Department has a program, too, that they're working with you. So they're here to, they're, they are there to help as well. So great resources to, you know, contact if you know anybody with issues or have issues yourself and need to get help. Um, the other thing is our TV show. We can broadcast this out and get the message out there, you know, really more widespread. So again, I thank you for being on the show. Well, you know, and again, thank, thank you for having me. I mean, this, again, this is, this is a great issue that, that we really need to educate yep. our, our community on. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Um, this concludes our episode for Quality of Life, the Heroin Abuse. Uh, on behalf of Dr. Croft, WSCS, I'm Dave Augustine. Thank you for watching. Thank you.